Hello and welcome to part two of our special AMS live stream hour series on electrifying vehicle production. For those of you who joined us last month where we delved into how electrification was changing manufacturing processes for tier one suppliers, today we're gonna, we're gonna move further upstream uh, talking with a pack session on how OEMs can scale down and, and opti scale up and optimize EV manufacturing. Uh, my name is Christopher Ludwig, editor in chief here at Ultima Media and AMS. And I'm Nick Holt, editor at AMS, and today we'll be your hosts. We've got an agenda today that will take us through the lessons and insights from serial production of EVs, as well as insights into how manufacturers are planning new technology and processes for future powertrain and vehicle assembly lines. We're also going to hear from manufacturing specialists on specific technologies for EVs, uh, including advanced inspection and metrology systems, new joining and vision systems, across the battery pack and electric vehicle manufacturing operation. And, and shortly, we're, we're really thrilled for the expert guests who, who will be joining us. Um, we'll hear in a short while from Danny Auerswald from Volkswagen Group who on, on the start of ID3 production at the plant in Dresden. Uh, we'll be joined by Gareth Tompkinson from Renishaw, hearing more about advanced metrology inspection systems and impacts for EVs, uh, Chris White, uh, from, from Ford, will be telling us more about the Ford E-Prime project and more on electrifying powertrains and powertrains and James McAllister from Atlas Cupco uh, giving us a lot more insight as well on, on battery, battery pack assembly. So really a fantastic jam-packed show here. So what are we seeing across the electric vehicle and battery manufacturing space? So along with the, the sort of steady ramp up of volumes that we're seeing and the growing, increasingly growing pipeline of products that's coming onto the market, electric vehicles are still having a big impact across the automotive manufacturing, uh, engineering and production processes. And, so, and also with uh, the supplier management side of things. So some of the trends we've picked up on uh, reporting on AMS, um, we're seeing uh, new suppliers in the R&D and production and sourcing uh, areas, especially in things like battery cells, uh, high voltage systems. Also, uh, in terms of the battery pack integration, uh, electric motors, drivetrains, these require new tooling, they have different tolerances and also require higher uh, enhanced safety systems and safety processes uh, during the assembly. Quality control is also a big deal. It's always been part of the vehicle manufacturing operation, but there are new, new areas with the new solutions and challenges that have been thrown up by the EV side of it. Uh, an EV motor, for instance, is considerably different to uh, a, a nice motor. Um, so that's kind of the areas that we're kind of picking up on uh, in trends across, across AMS. And obviously that's something that we'll be picking up on hopefully today during our panel discussions. Yeah, and I think also do maybe a point a couple of other areas that we're going to pick up with some of our, our, our panelists. Uh, clearly, the modular design of electrical electric vehicles and, and, and production processes is having some impacts from automation, and we're hearing a lot more and potential around uh, cell, cellular manufacturing as well. And one of the key things that's, of course, driving differences in production strategies, tooling, and, and also flexibility is the different approaches that OEMs are taking, whether they're building the same power, different powertrains on the same line or factory or, or having dedicated plants. And, and today we'll, of course, get some reflections, perhaps, and, and insights from, from both sides of that. Um, Another thing that we're looking forward to picking up on is a sort of convergence of connected plant technologies, digital technologies with EV, EV rollouts and, 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 and production. So, so obviously more connectivity in the plant uh, as we upgrade to EV uh, and the opportunities that are coming with that. And along the way, of course, there's the growing pains of launching production, which wouldn't which would be the same for any product really, but we're going to look into some of the specific issues for EV when it comes to scaling production, whether it's challenges in forecasting, new skills and capabilities that are needed, and as Nick mentioned earlier, of course, uh, supplier management issues too. So we'll be covering many of those topics and more today. The agenda for this session is broken up into segments with each guest, which will follow on from Chris and I. Um, and we'll be focusing on their expertise in a sort of mix of uh, interviews that we'll be doing with them and also in the later panel discussion. So for that, please put your questions and comments to our panel uh, throughout the show, and we will be raising those uh, with our guests 
uh, across across the session. And you can do that via the chat box, which is in the right hand side, bottom of the court, of the your of your screen there. And we'd just also like to to recognise our, our partners for for today for today's show, uh, Renishaw, which is one of the world's leading engineering and scientific companies uh, in areas like a, a precision measurement and additive manufacturing, and playing a bigger role uh, in hybrid and electric vehicle production. And Atlas Cupco uh, provides industrial power tools, systems, assembly solutions, quality assurance, software, and more to global automotive and and again increasingly active in EV and battery pack space. Just a quick uh, reminder for everyone, um, for those of you who missed part one of our of our show um, on Tier Supplier, you can watch it on demand. So we're going to send a link your way right now uh, after the show. Check that out. Um, we had we had uh, insights from from ZF and from Gestamp, amongst others. Uh, so there's a chance still to catch up on that. And finally, um, with that, let's let's get to our our first our first guests, and um, it's really my pleasure to 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 bring on shortly Danny Auerswald from Volkswagen. Danny has held a variety of production and logistics roles at Volkswagen, including plant manager and director uh, for the group in Malaysia. Uh, he came last year to the transparent factory in Dresden, uh, took over as plant manager, where of course he was working to launch production of the ID3, which kicked off earlier this year. Danny, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, Chris. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Yeah, great. So, so Danny, I think you've got a couple of uh, of slides just to kind of set the scene and introduce a little bit more about the strategy at Dresden and Volkswagen. So I'm just going to hand that to you, and then we'll go into a couple of questions. Cool. Okay. Thanks, Chris. So uh, to start with, I would like to give you a brief overview about uh, VW's way to e-mobility and how the the roadmap for electric cars look like here in the VW Group, and in particular uh, in Dresden uh, for the plant which I'm heading. So if you go to the next slide, please, uh, here you can see, or I, I would like to give you the, the extent to which uh, VW Group is driving this uh, electric offensive. Um, you can clearly say, I, at, at least from, from our point of view, we consider this as the, the largest electric program in the automotive sector. So the entire group will invest over 60 billion euros for electric cars and also digitization. Uh, and nearly half of it is spent on uh, electric cars, uh, which I will come to uh, later on in a bit more detail. But to give you some ideas uh, of the scale itself, so until 2029, uh, we are planning to bring 75 new pure electric cars, so-called BEVs, and also the, the hybrid cars will play an even more important role, especially in markets that are still in a very early stage of the transition to the electric era. And in numbers, uh, until 2029, we plan to produce more than, and also to sell more than 26 million electric cars. And as you can imagine, uh, if you want to have one one factory completely filled here we're talking about a capacity of 300,000 units per year so you can imagine uh, how far we have to to go in order to migrate all these uh, production facilities we have uh, worldwide and, and globally uh, to migrate to an electric um, approach and electric production lines um, the the first rollout and the first kickoff was basically started in Zwickau, which is a German city uh, 100 kilometers away from Dresden in the eastern part of Germany and uh, Dresden is the first follower, so to say, of the ID3 production, uh, which for sure benefits from the proximity to Zwickau and we also learn a lot uh, from, from the experiences there and also to further develop uh, the knowledge on how to build electric cars efficiently in order for other uh, VW plants to benefit from that. And uh, when it comes to Dresden, uh, maybe you can change, uh, flip to the next page. Um, what, what are we doing here? So some of you might know uh, the, the plant here started in 2001 with a Phaeton, which is basically the, 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 the premium segment car and after that was stopped in 2015, I, I think, um, the, the first idea of an electric car was 
basically uh, started here. We we changed the powertrain of the Golf 7, uh, replaced it with a fully electric uh, powertrain, and the e-Golf was born. Uh, so, so to say, we were the the first uh, plant in Germany that produced electrical cars on a with a with a serial production, and later on we also switched to the ID3, uh, following Civico as uh, let's say first mover, and now we are the second plant in Germany to build electric cars. And as you, if you recall the numbers from the beginning, there are many more to come. And we also want to not only produce the cars, but also to show uh, potential customers and visitors uh, how the whole ecosystem of ID is is working. Uh, so we are not only uh, doing the production here, um, but we also uh, have a lot of research activities in smart uh, production uh, technologies, in digital solutions, how to combine all these uh, big data approaches uh, and to upscale it into a serious production. Uh, so we learn basically the, the, the ideas here and then we uh, migrate it into other plants to benefit also from that uh, lessons learned. And um, as you might know, the whole idea of ID is not only to, to replace uh, the, the powertrain of a normal combustion car, with an electric driven car, but it's more the whole ecosystem that is uh, coming more and more into uh, the picture. So that means the whole connectivity ideas and, and solutions, um, the whole um, sustainability uh, question, how to produce electric cars uh, emission free. So the, the whole plant here is also uh, CO2 neutral and we're working heavily to having it really CO2 free so that there's no more uh, need of uh, emission certificates to, to buy from, from elsewhere. So uh, we are really looking forward to, first of all, have the discussion here, but also to, to push uh, the whole idea of, of uh, the ID and the whole electric mobility thing uh, more into view and so far the success is is really overwhelming uh, so the the sales numbers are pretty good all across europe and now with the id4 uh, which is basically the bigger brother of the id3 in the targeting for the suv segment uh, is basically a car for the world as uh, it's very attractive in all the the bigger segments worldwide and uh, it's a bit early to say what will be launched here in the very near future as it's not official yet uh, but be sure there's way more to come great more to come and, and we look forward to keeping up with you on that danny so just maybe um a couple of questions whilst um you know because we'll, we'll have a couple questions here and then we'll join in the panel um the sales are off to a pretty good start, which is good. From a production side, you had a SOP for zero production, I believe, in January. Now, there's been a few disruptions in the wider automotive industry, which everybody knows about. Um, how would you say uh, zero production has gone from an EV side here? Uh, you know, what have been the bumps in the road? What, what, what have been the lessons learned already so far? I mean, the, the good thing is that we didn't start from scratch. Uh, so we had quite some experience already with electric cars. As as I mentioned, we, we produced the e-Golf um, before the ID3. So when it comes to the qualification point of view, which is usually quite critical when you start uh, or when you migrate from a from a either a new plant or when you migrate from a, a normal production uh, facility building um, combustion cars into an EV car, uh, the qualification is quite key uh, when it comes to safety measures, when it comes to how to deal with batteries, how to handle batteries, how to deal with high voltage uh, switches and everything. Uh, that, that is usually quite a, a game changer for every uh, plant manager who, who's not really familiar with, with all that EV challenges. Uh, when it comes to the supply, you mentioned before there, there have been some, some bumps on the supply chain as well. Uh, so far, touch wood, um, uh, it's it's going pretty well for for our ID3 so far. Uh, um, all the semiconductor issues, uh, yes, uh, we we already can feel the impact, but so far it's it's going quite okay, especially when our sub suppliers uh, allocate their material accordingly uh, in order to give way for the for the EV cars. Uh, at the moment, the regular combustion cars are suffering way more. 
and, and, and obviously, as you mentioned, obviously had produced, produced Ego, so understood aspects of electric, electric mobility production already. Yeah. Obviously, with the MEB, it brings a whole host of, of other, other aspects, but also advantages, I suppose, too. I mean, one of the things we observe is, is the modularization um, uh, in terms of production. How is that changing your production planning and, and assembly um, in Dresden? Yeah, also quite, in quite, a, quite a lot. Uh, I mean, the, the Ego was basically a combustion car uh, where the battery was designed into it and now with the MEB uh, the, the battery is basically the, the starting point and the entire car or the entire platform was designed around it and especially when you when you combine the idea of having a, a smart product design with a smart production design uh, then you have huge benefits especially when it comes to the sequence of assembly uh, when it comes to the the modules you deliver to the right to the line, and also how let's say the the sub suppliers, especially the module suppliers, are involved in that whole production planning process. Uh, when it comes to the conveyor system, when it comes to how the the modules are delivered into the plant, that you can reduce the handling efforts, and also when it comes to optimization, I think that's also quite a, a big thing. Uh, and I, I am, I'm pretty sure we come to that in the panel discussion later on, how big data is, is affecting all this, yeah? how data is exchanged with these uh, module suppliers that will become more and more important. Yeah, that's a really interesting point, definitely something we're going to pick up on. But on that point, I mean, Volkswagen's had a big initiative with Amazon Web Services in the last couple of years with the industrial cloud. And so clearly, and also, you know, your MEB, you're one of eight plants that will be producing it. So clearly, connectivity of, of production seems to be kind of in part of the DNA of this. So, so how, how far along is, 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 is Dresden and your partner plants um, in implementing the cloud and, and enabling that sort of uh, big data connectivity? Yeah, at the moment, we are some some kind of first mover when it comes to this whole uh, cloud uh, and thing, and also the interfaces into the cloud. Yeah, which data is shared, uh, which data is collected, and data collection is one thing, uh, but how to work with the data, how to analyze it, and how to to get the right conclusions out of it is basically the key element. And so what we are doing here is on a on a very small or on a smaller level compared to Swigau, for instance. Um, to uh, submit this data in the cloud to see what connections are really necessary in order to share that in an efficient way with other plants. Because if you just submit the data, uh, no one is able to work with it. Uh, so you, you definitely have to see the synergies, what we have at the moment with the same platform. And especially when it comes to welding processes, for instance, when you see you have a certain issue with... Uh, let's say a subframe of the, the battery or the whole uh, powertrain, then you can easily submit this to other plants and they can check their welding parameters just to confirm whether they have the same issue or not. So I think the, the way of interacting and how to close uh, quality loops uh, will, will increase tremendously. Absolutely. So as I mentioned, we're going to pick up on more of that with our panel. I suppose just the last point on that is that you know that obviously can help in the in the production itself. Do you see that you know also in in managing change processes? So as you have engineering changes, design changes, part changes, you know, will will that sort of connectivity as you get in any kind of serial production launch, right? Is that also already a benefit? Yeah, I mean the the speed is picking up more and more. Uh, I mean in the past you had a product life cycle that was basically seven years, and then you had one big facelift after three or four years and yeah, now you have constant changes not only driven by the hardware itself meaning the, the, the parts but also and especially the software uh, so i think handling all these software changes and updates that are done in the plant itself but also uh, in the during the life cycle over the air uh, updates uh, with the customer that he doesn't even have to go to the workshop anymore uh, I think this is now also one thing uh, we have to clearly focus on in production. Absolutely. Well, Danny, thank you so much for that. We're going to bring you back um, for our panel discussion, but um, uh, we'll, 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 we'll sort of say thanks for now and welcome back so we can have our, our next guests. Um, for those of you interested in, in reading more on Volkswagen strategy and a bit more, please check out as well our latest uh, digital edition. Um, um, from there, where you can you can read a bit more. There's a link putting through in the chat shortly for you there. Um, but in the meantime, I'm gonna gonna hand back to to Nick to bring on our next guest. Thanks, Chris. 
Um, I'd like to now bring uh, Gareth Tonkinson from Renishaw. Hi, Gareth. Um, Hi. I understand um, you've been working with OEMs on their powertrain uh, side of things on production, but I know you're going to offer a bit of an introduction and some insights from your side onto how um, the mobility uh, drive is, is changing and affecting uh, production operations. So I'm going to let you have a presentation, you've got a few slides, and then we'll get back and have a few questions in a moment. Okay, right. Thanks, Nick. Yep, as, as Nick said, my name's Gareth Tomkinson. Um, I'm a mechanical and production engineer and I've worked for Renishaw for 25 years now. Um, I think the first thing for us to acknowledge here uh, is the sheer scale and breadth of the technological changes that are happening uh, as we all move towards carbon neutral economies in around 2050, which, which sounds a long way away, but, but probably will come quicker than we think. Um, I think this affects many different areas, uh, including power generation, manufacturing, transport, and, and a lot of others. And certainly automotive is at front and center for many of those changes with, with a foot in the um, manufacturing camp and also a foot in the transportation camp. So whether we're talking about developments in uh, levels of driving autonomy or vehicle connectivity or the switch from combustion power towards hybrids or full electric or hydrogen fuel cells. This is all driven by uh, an ever more environmentally conscious general public, but probably more importantly by government legislation. I think make no mistake, it's the government legislation that really drives these things. So this brings certainly some brand new challenges that as engineers we have to solve. Um, and I'd like to raise just a few of them here today. Um, if, for example, we take the new electrified powertrain designs that promise to become dominant in the next five to 10 years, you'll find that they contain some of the most tightly tolerant components to be found anywhere on the vehicle. And they're critical to both reliability and efficiency, something we now take for granted with cars. Um, the efficiency is especially important as today's batteries are still heavy and expensive. And so any efficiency gains that you can leverage help to either extend the range or reduce battery size uh, or both. Uh, and, and therefore that reduces cost. Um, having a good design is obviously useful, but that's just the start. You also need to be able to translate the CAD drawings and models into real world parts and to do that reliably and repeatedly. So today's manufacturing processes are themselves embarking on their own revolution under the banner of Industry 4.0. Danny has already mentioned VW's work with big data. Uh, and in simple terms, one of the things, just one of the things that this means is to take advantage of technologies and connectivity to create manufacturing processes that have an inbuilt capability to both self-monitor and self-correct whilst operating under a wide range of variable conditions. Now, to do this, firstly, you identify all of the process variables before measuring the important ones and applying logic to make corrections based on the data. Sounds very simple. Obviously, there are many challenges to taking it from a theory into reality, but I think a clarity of purpose before embarking on any big data is, is very, very important. Um, if uh, we look at the history of mass production, if there's one thing that it's shown us, it is that the most efficient way of repeatedly making the same component over and over again is to use dedicated tools and processes for each individual task. However, what today's automotive industry is demanding is more akin to mass customization, where the processes that are, are being used are flexible enough to accommodate a mixed range of variants with often small but very significant differences. Um, Another driver for flexible processes, uh, and again, Danny mentioned this, is that the product life cycles are shortening and the pace of product development is therefore accelerating. Um, put another way, the clock speed of new technologies has never ticked faster. And this creates a big problem for manufacturing. And that problem is that the capital investment in the sophisticated production equipment 
uh, needs large volumes to amortize any upfront costs. When production designs are changing so rapidly, that means that the equipment needs to be capable of being repurposed with minimal changes or additional investment. And, and we have examples of that. Um, this flexibility also, of course, applies to the inspection equipment. Uh, a dedicated gauge is all but useless in some of these situations we're talking about now. What you need is a flexible gauge, which can be reprogrammed. Crucially, they have to be right next to the manufacturing equipment and preferably digitally connected to them so that the data captured can be quickly processed and adjustments made automatically and in real time. Sending parts off to a central lab just isn't quick enough. You might produce scrap for hours before finding out the results and then trying to work out what to adjust when the results say that the parts failed. Um, and that's never be been more true uh, than when you're to talking about coping with uh, multiple design changes. Um, if you also take advantage of the latest five axis inspection technologies, you'll firstly find that your CMM is suddenly far quicker. And secondly, it has the ability to carry out a far wider range of inspection tasks. So that enables you to do things like remove manual processes like surface finish stations altogether. And if the parts change, you simply reprogram that single device to accommodate it and to choose you uh, to, to cope with that, you choose the most suitable sensor, sensor from the change rack. So in summary, I think we're in a period of rapid change. Uh, and the most innovative manufacturers are certainly demanding processes that are both agile and smart to drive down their costs and also to improve quality. Renishaw has been developing these techniques in our own manufacturing facilities for over 30 years, and then in turn helping our own customers and their manufacturing uh, plants to apply these techniques uh, to benefit their own uh, their own products. So very exciting times, lots of opportunities and plenty of reasons to be cheerful. Thanks, Gareth. Um, we've just got a couple of minutes left for, for a couple of questions, if you're okay. Um, you, sure. you mentioned flexibility, and that's a big deal across automotive manufacturing. Um, from from Renishaw's point of view, can you expand on that a little bit? And talk about how that might work in practice from, from your side of things. Okay, yes. I mean, we it doesn't matter where you are, by the way, in, in the world, uh, the, the labor rate changes, but some things never go out of fashion. So I think the flexibility is, is being driven more than ever before. Um, from the point of view of people don't know what's coming around the corner, you, you've got a fair idea of what you're going to produce, but you can't afford to design a process purely for one product and then have that product change ever so slightly and you throw things away. You, you have to be flexible. We have examples of customers who've used the five axis inspection technologies, for example, for combustion engine uh, inspection. So cylinder heads, blocks, cranks, et cetera, and used that very successfully. And now when they're embarking upon EV manufacture, you're looking at things like um, controlling air gap, for example. So um, if, could, you, could you just show that slide, that second slide again, uh, Nick? On, on that second slide, there's a little image which I'd, I'd like to, to point out. So that, that image top right there is a, a stator. And one of, the, one of the most important things of the stator is the air gap. Too tight and things potentially get hot or you get contact, too wide, and you end up with inefficiencies. So what we're doing there is we're, we've helped one manufacturer to measure the concentricity between the rotor bearing mounts, and that's the little yellow areas, top and bottom, and the green area in the middle, which is the where the rotor spins. It's the air gap between the, the rotor and the stator you're, you're interested in. Now, it's not a particularly difficult measurement until you realize the access is an absolute nightmare. So you have to use the five axis capability to get in and measure that information, get, get that information and actually carry out the scans. And I've got time for probably just one more question before we move on to the panel session. But you, I mean, on that on that thing about design changes and the challenges thereabouts, I mean, again, from your system, looking at quality control systems, how, when design changes come along, how, how do those, this kind of design, this kind of inspection system cope with that? Okay, so it's a case of reprogramming 
in many cases. So you can look at things like um, parametric programs. If you know that the parts coming down are going to be roughly the same, but just some minor uh, changes to size, then often you can put a, a program in place where you can just change those sizes. So you know you can have a, a very varying range with a, a number of different sizes and do it that way. Um, so yeah, that, that's probably a, as, as good an example as any. Right, I think we, we're going to now um, move on to our next panel. Thanks for that, Gareth. We're going to pick up Thank with you, you uh, later on in the panel session. Uh, so thanks very much for that. So uh, before we move on to our next, if you want to read any more uh, on these flexible uh, measurement solutions, you can check out the article here. There should be a link now appearing in your chat box. And with that, I'll hand over to Chris. Thanks very much. Thanks, Nick and, and Gareth, and I'm really pleased to, to welcome Chris White, Electrification Manager of Manufacturing Engineer Europe, and Chris has been involved in some, some really key projects that we're looking forward to hearing about, which I'm going to hand over to you in a moment. Chris, tell us more about, particularly E-Prime, um, um, and, and what some exciting developments there as Ford looks ahead to his powertrain, but you've got a couple of slides to kick us off and set the scene, so, so let's do that and then come back for some Q&A. Great. Well, um, yes, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so my name is Chris White. I'm a, a manufacturing engineer. I've been with Ford for 30 years um, and um, we're within the powertrain manufacturing engineering group. So I've seen a lot of engine plants and transmission plants built in my time. Um, but of course, that those days are now firmly behind us. Um, the, the chances of building a brand new facility for an engine are, are pretty low. Um, and so I'm now leading a project called E-Prime. Uh, I have led this project for sort of the last three years. Um, and it's really about that transition that we've had to go on as a group of people, uh, as a group of engineers, into the manufacture of, uh, of powertrains for, for electrified vehicles. And so it's, it's about looking at the skills that we need within those teams and also the technology that we need. Um, it's actually a consortium based project. So uh, within the UK, um, we have the Advanced Proportion Centre and they run a series of competitions for funding um, and uh, ours was uh, an APC8 um, competition um, and so with a series of partners um, we've, we've achieved some some funding from the government. Um, it's actually based at uh, our Dunton campus here in, in the UK um, and one of the things we've done there is build a full fully operational pilot facility that makes status rotors and battery arrays which are kind of new technology for us um, and that's then positioned us very well now for the uh, for the growth of uh, facilities that we're going to see in Europe for electrified powertrain in Ford. Um, just a few, a few mentions of our partners so um, we have JW Frolic they're a uh, sorry just go back a slide um, that there are uh, they're a test partner so they make uh, test machines so they've been working with us on some of the test equipment we need for electrified powertrain Siemens, um, probably best known within Ford for, for their support around the, the uh, control systems we have on our equipment, but actually a big part within this project has been around digitization and helping us um, manage our data in, in, in our manufacturing world. National Instruments, um, specializing data acquisition and the types of systems that we use um, for, for keeping data. Danny mentioned data and how important it's becoming and, and National Instruments play a really key part in that. Signal Noise um, are a data visualization company, so they've been helping us look at uh, how we can display our data differently and make different conclusions from that data. HSMI, the High Speed Sustainable Manufacturing Institute, a research technology organization who have been working with us on, on, on some of the manufacturing challenges that we have. And then Skillnet are our, our training partner, so they've been helping us with that. So if we move to the next slide now, um, Kind of where did E-Prime fit? So, so traditionally the focus uh, um, has been around product development and new products and quite rightly um, significant challenges there. And then on the other side of this, if, this chain, um, you've got the, the manufacturing operations, which have a significant um, transition to go through. And Danny talked about that, of course. But in the middle, um, you've got the manufacturing engineering organization that takes, one, takes the design through to, to production. And, and in that sits a manufacturing engineering chain, so a supply chain. So a series of suppliers of components that go into machines that we buy and services that we need. And it's really been about stimulating that supply base. So the whole idea, idea of, 
of the government support was to stimulate that supply base in the UK and make sure that we continue to be as good at leading in this area um, as we were in, in engines. So that was the, really, the, the, the prime reason for our project. And it falls really into three key areas. So um, it's all about developing school, uh, uh, key skills, as you can see on the, on the left here, their manufacturing engineering skills. And then we've done that in sort of three, three focus areas. The first one I've mentioned, which is building this, this scale up facility. Um, so it's a fully production relevant uh, facility. It's not a prototype facility. We deliberately decided not to buy equipment that could just make the product. It has to be able to make it in the way that we're going to scale up and use in the long term. Um, so it runs at rate. It has all of the, the, the control solutions that we expect. And it's really been about trying to understand that process. But what we mustn't forget, of course, is we've also got a lot of equipment um, which will, will or could be redundant um, from, from our um, engines and from our transmissions. So we also spent a lot of time focusing on how we might repurpose that equipment, how we might reuse that equipment to help us in this trans transition. So we've done a lot of studies and work on not just equipment, but also some of the infrastructure as well that we might be able to reuse as we go forward. And then finally, I mentioned it briefly with Siemens. We're also um, spending a lot of time on the digital side of the, of the business. So um, the way that we do manufacturing engineering also needs to change significantly. So how we have this single thread of data going through our, through our processes, we build our factories digitally before we then build them you know, correctly to that, uh, that data, uh, data flow um, has been really important. And we've really spent a lot of time experimenting with that in the project too. Okay, so I think uh, that kind of covers the project. Um, it's been a really exciting and interesting project to uh, to, to be part of, and uh, you know now's the time, right? We're ready to to go. Uh, absolutely, as you say, ready to go. I mean, it's uh, on the cusp of uh, of quite a transformation to, to come, certainly for Ford and the whole and the whole industry, as as you outline. And and this project seems like such a such a great well testing ground, but also you know real real running off point for, for the next thing to come. Can you share any, you know, as you look to the, the next phase of starting to scale up and move move into, into the next phase, what, what are some of the kind of, you know, key lessons or, or, or aspects from a manufacturing engineering point of view that, you know, that you you have to overcome to, to start to scale the electrified powertrain production? Um, so, that, so there are some key components. I mean, Gareth showed a lot of pictures of what we call status there in, in, in his presentation. That's one example of a, of a component that's particularly different um, and some way from the types of skills and technology that we have today for putting together motors uh, to, for engines. But I have to say as well, there are, there are equally a number of key core things that we do today extremely well and we'll continue to be able to do extremely well going forward. So assembling components, um, machining gears, machining cases, all those sorts of things are very similar to what we've done in the past, but there are some specifics. So things like Stata have new technologies in them. So things like um, laser welding, lots of uh, different technology for distributing insulating materials. So trickling varnish, uh, applying an epoxy, that sort of thing. So there, there are some, some, some very new different skills, but they're complementary to the skills that we have today. And, and do you see, for example, the E-Prime project and the work you're doing now kind of equally applying to the transitional phases of, of, of increased hybridization, obviously Ford will, will in the first instance naturally have more PHEV and hybridization as it goes to full EV, um, or, or is it actually quite a departure when we then go into the fully electrified powertrain focus there? No, I, I think from a manufacturing engineering perspective, um, hybrid designs and, and, and full BEV designs are pretty similar. Um, you know, within Ford, it's kind of a family of uh, the first, the first sort of family. Uh, you know, the, the the parts fit as well in a in a hybrid transition uh, transmission as they will in a, a full um, Bev drive. And similarly, the battery architectures are quite similar. I mean, that will probably change over time. But for now, focusing on how we put together something for a for a hybrid drive versus um, a full Bev. It, it, it's not a big a big change for us. It's not a big difference. Um, so you know, it, it it is just a case of uh, understanding that technology. The, the the change to to the technology for either is 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 the big challenge, not necessarily moving from one to the other. And I, I think it, it it's taken as read that <clears throat> clearly by developing this 
prototype facility with, with the view to developing for its in-house skills. I mean, I'm not necessarily talking about building a battery cell as such, but clearly Ford will be building these arrays and modules and, and wants these capabilities um, in-house effectively. Uh, yeah, so we have plans um, for, for in-house manufacturer. Obviously can't go into too many details about those today, um, but it's all about being ready. And, and in some cases, it may not be about um, having in-house manufacturing capability. It may be about being a smart buyer. So uh, we've we've seen, you know, this this is going to be a very different marketplace. And and any, even if you want to buy these components, you're going to need to be able to understand how they're put together and how you know how people are doing that on your behalf particularly well. So either way, whether it's become a smart buyer or become an in-house manufacturer, this type of facility will definitely help. Yeah, absolutely. So there's quite a few things we're going to pick up in the panel. Maybe just one more point, Chris, before we we, we go there. Um, Obviously, the the the, pro, the work with partners like HSS, MI, uh, JW Froelich, we talked about the digitalization, potential digital twins. Can you tell us just a little bit more about what that's kind of helping you to achieve so far on this journey? Yeah, I mean, uh, traditionally, um, you know, we have quite long lead times in terms of building facilities, and and it's not unusual for us to get to the physical facility and find that you know the. the the very complex building blocks that, that make up that facility don't fit together as we thought they were going to. Um, you know, machines clash with with building columns. We don't. We realise you know things are too you know too far away from each other for them to work correctly from a maybe from a digital connection point of view or, or whatever. So we we know that there's an awful lot that we can do in advance um, digitally that will save us a lot of time. And it's all about trying to bring that forward. It's about trying to get digital assets for machines and parts and bring them all together in the virtual world so that we've got a full digital clone of the factory that we fully test and understand before we start you know putting metal down um, and i think that's incredibly important and then as you go as danny mentioned about reconfiguring the facility doing all that in the digital world costs you nothing and it's a real you know it, it's a real quick answer as to whether whether you can do things or you can't um trying it out obviously is, is is not an option in our business in, in a real physical factory so it'll help us verify changes and make sure that we can make them very quickly absolutely when the digital space we always talk about having a ready to fail try and fail culture that doesn't work when you're when you're in a live assembly space right but it definitely can in the digital simulation chris thanks so much for this we're going to pick up more of that with our panel uh in in a couple of minutes but we're going to bring on our next guest so so thanks for joining us and we'll be bringing you on again shortly so um, I'm going to hand back to Nick and, and introduce James, but uh, just a reminder to our audience, I hope you're enjoying the show so far. Um, a reminder, in a couple of weeks, we have another great live stream coming on the Factory of the Future and the Software Defined Assembly line. So there's a registration link which is coming to you right now. But let me hand it over to, 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 to Nick and to, and to James McAllister at Atlas, Atlas Copco. Thanks, Chris. Um, yes, wanted to bring James on board. Hi, James. Um, Hi, Nick. Yeah, you. thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be a part of the panel today. You're welcome. Um, James, um, I know from previous discussions, there's quite a lot of uh, uh, EV production expertise with Atlas Copco. Could you just give us a quick intro and a bit of oversight into the areas that you're involved with? Yeah, just to give everyone a quick introduction to Atlas Copco. Atlas Copco is a uh, global company with sales, service and manufacturing in over 80 countries around the uh, the world. The group itself is very much involved with EVs uh, in different business areas. For example, the vacuum technique business area is heavily involved with the supply and uh, uh, vacuum equipment, for which is used in fabrication shops uh, that produce uh, semiconductors and screens uh, for EVs. Um, the compressor technique business area is involved with the refinement of materials and components that go into EV batteries and, and EVs. And what I wanted to talk about today was really the industrial technique business area, which is it focuses on the joining technologies that bring all of these components together uh, in the EV battery and across the electric vehicle itself. So um, Atlas Copco invests a lot into R&D every year and there are a lot of innovations but what I wanted to do today was really focus on the, 
the game changers that are going to bring a lot of value for our customers and, and, and partners. Uh, I understand a lot of the people listening today are likely to be either designing lines or, or manufacturing uh, EVs, and uh, they're probably focused on um, the, the key values or benefits and uh, with EVs, which would be to reduce weight, uh, to make EVs travel further, reduce time to market to launch vehicles quicker, and also reduce costs so that to make electric vehicles more affordable. Therefore, when I introduce the, uh, the five joining technologies and talk about those, I'll try and keep focused on those, those key benefit areas. Uh, and you mentioned the joining technologies. Now, this is, this is kind of a growing area, and there are, there's, there's an interesting combination of joining technologies that are now employed uh, around battery cells. Um, could you talk us through the sort of latest innovations in this sort of area of EV assembly? Absolutely. If you could uh, go through to the next slide. Um, here I'll present the five joining technologies. And to start with, I'll focus on tightening. And uh, what I want to do is present three new game-changing innovations. Uh, the first of which is smart tooling with a built-in controller. So traditionally, tools would have a separate physical controller. But by creating a smart tool, and building in the intelligence into the tool uh, on the line, there is less need for physical infrastructure, uh, minimal IT infrastructure, so there's cost savings here, combined with greater flexibility and ease of line rebalancing. So that's a key innovation. Moving on to the second big innovation for um, uh, tightening, and that is reactionless, low reaction tools with full traceability. So through a series of micropulses now to build up the torque, the operators feel minimal forces when, when they're using the tools. So this means, again, less physical infrastructure on the production line, higher productivity, and uh, again, ease of line rebalancing. Um, the third innovation around uh, tightening would be positioning. So using indoor wireless technologies, camera systems and, and gyroscopes built into the tool, it's now possible to detect the position of the tools relative to the vehicle or the component that's being fitted uh, to make sure that the correct assembly parameters are being used against that uh, component and that the data is linked to the correct vehicle. And this positioning is now down to 10 millimeters or bolt level accuracy, which is a significant step forward. So. Here we see three disruptive technologies which can have a major impact on the traditional assembly line design and processes. So it's nice to see these innovations really becoming a reality. Secondly, if we uh, move on to look at adhesive bonding and sealing. So the big innovation here is the new EDA technology, IDDA, uh, which is for the SEA product line. And traditionally, adhesive material is applied via a dispensing process uh, to create the bead. Now, with the new EDA technology, it effectively prints the bead instead. And the, the benefits of this technology are significant in terms of it's more flexible um, to apply the bead in terms of the distance of application, but also the angle of application. It's a higher quality application and also it lowers the cost because the material consumption is lower as well. So significant benefits there with that uh, dispenser. If we move on now to look at uh, self-pierce riveting, I'll introduce a couple of key innovations here. And that would be firstly that on the, firstly high strength steel and ultra high strength steel self-pierce rivets. So traditionally cars have been either more aluminium intensive or steel intensive. But in today's modern cars, the, the materials are very much mixed. So the Henrol product line has, has innovated uh, and created rivets to be able to join these high strength steels and ultra high strength steels together with aluminium or plastic based materials and even carbon fiber. So it's a, it's a big, big innovation there. If we then move on to look at the next new technology for self-pierce riveting. It's narrow flange technology. And this 
has the uh, ability to reduce the flange size that's being joined and thereby reducing the material, reducing the weight of the vehicle, and of course, reducing the cost of the vehicle. So typically this technology is used on door apertures, but there are many other applications on an EV to reduce weights using this technology. And uh, we estimate a saving of around about one kilogram is possible on some, some vehicles just by using this technology alone. Then if we go on to look at the uh, next technology, which is flow drill fastening, um, here the big innovation would be a magazine feed. So this is very useful technology when you're applying large amounts of screws in one shot. So for example, on a battery lid, uh, you know, battery lid there. Um, so when you use this technology with a robot, it avoids the use of a hose. It means faster cycle times and less movement of the robot and less energy consumption as a consequence. So that's very uh, popular technology right now. Then if we move on to the next technology, uh, the final joining technology is uh, micro dispensing and, and potting. And this is with the Shogunflow product line. And um, if you combine micro dispensing with vacuum, uh, you get vacuum dispensing. And th this process you can use to improve the quality uh, of the material being applied and the process. Um, and when you're applying it to EV components, such as typically it would be the wiring on an EV electrical motor, that type of thing is where you would use uh, vacuum dispensing. Then if we go on to look at the next technology here, this is vision. It isn't in itself a joining technology, but when you combine vision technologies, it gets very exciting. Um, and you can use vision to verify the position of the uh, joining technology, the quality of the joining process, and also adjust uh, the joining process accordingly to what, it, what is seen. So it's uh, particularly interesting to see when you combine those things. It's interesting. It's interesting and revealing to see all of those joining technologies laid out like that for kind of essentially one application, if you want to call it that. So could you, we've just got one time for sort of one bit more question. Um, could you describe how these technologies come together in EV battery assembly, kind of like the key, key steps? Sure, absolutely. If you want to go to the uh, next slide, uh, here uh, it's very interesting when you sort of join these technologies up and, and, and understand where you would use the joining technologies and, and also, uh, uh, you know, why. Um, and then what, what we do typically is break down EV battery joining into seven steps. So the first step is the cell stack assembly with dispensing. And here, if you have cylindrical cells, you would normally use the sugar fluid micro dispensing technology which with a, together with a low viscosity material. And this provides heat exchange um, and, and strengthens the cylindrical cells as you want to build up the strength of the battery tray as it forms part of the car body structure. So the cells themselves are quite delicate and you do not want to introduce uh, heat into this process. So typically a two component system is, is used for this process. Um, prismatic cells are slightly different and they would use a standard SCA dispensing process. The second step is module assembly via self pierce riveting. And uh, what uh, is interesting here, I think, is that welding would create heat and weld splatter. So a cold joining process, such as Henrob self pierce riveting, is typically deployed. So the big advantages here are that there's no hazardous uh, vapors are created and different, different materials can be joined, such as high strength steels and, and aluminium. If we go on to the third step, which is the battery tray. So if there are any handheld uh, tightening applications, you would deploy a one-handed low reaction tool here to tighten the joint and also use the other hand to hold the parts into position. And uh, typically during this step, self pierce riveting and dispensing joining tech uh, uh, can be deployed here as well. So that's the third step. If we now move on to the fourth step, which is the gap filler with dispensing. So this is a very interesting step. So here 
This is the application of thermal paste to assist with temperature management uh, so that the battery doesn't overheat. The gap filler itself is a thermal heat exchange material, which is conductive, but also highly abrasive with up to about 80% aluminium content. So this needs specially designed components in, within the joining technology to maintain durability of the equipment. Uh, it's also important to get this uh, process bubble free. So um, in, to maximize the conductivity and the, uh, the flow of heat from the battery cells. Um, so, and like with what Gareth was talking about here, it's normal to deploy what we call smart adjust. So uh, with the, as it's such a special uh, gap filler application, so we use the 3D vision technology to measure the curve of the base of the components uh, to determine how much material needs to be applied. And then we feed that information onto the, the dispensing equipment. So it's, uh, it's, it's yeah, adjusting uh, smartly to do that. Um, the next step, which is the fifth step, is actually the tightening of the modules. So the batteries uh, need to be, the battery modules need to be mounted on the top of the thermal paste. And this makes this joint typically a very soft joint. So um, as the paste is spread out across the surface of, uh, during the tightening process. So typically here is where you would deploy a multi-spindle tightening tool to ensure an even spread of the paste and uh, high quality joints as the spindles are uh, controlled simultaneously. So moving on to the next step, which is the cover sealing through dispensing of the bead and, and seal material. Here, protection against moisture, as you can imagine, is, is critical so that uh, water can't uh, get into the battery pack and also prevention of leakage of gas the other way from, uh, from the battery is, is critical should there be an issue with some of the battery cells. So it's a long B, so uh, it's, it's a, big, a big focus area today is to speed up this process and control the efficiency of the bead application to avoid waste using different uh, forms of the bead. Um, in this step is also common to work with, uh, to, to apply a a fire protection film over the battery lid cover as protection from melting and, and fire using a, a high viscosity epoxy. Moving on to the, the seventh and final step, and this is the uh, lid sealing. So hay flow flow drill uh, fastening is, is particularly suitable for the battery lid, which as you can imagine is quite large, and therefore there's some variability of the, uh, the tolerances of the uh, the components. Uh, steel battery covers are the norm due to better temperature resistance and uh, the application is only really available from one side. So flow drill fastening provides the flexibility to do this. Um, flow drill technology also allows the, the lid to be removed and replaced several times for maintenance in the field or, or replacement of the battery modules. Uh, plus flow drill is a conductive uh, process. So it forms a Faraday cage, so to prevent any electromagnetic interference should there be an issue with the cells. So that quickly summarizes the different joining steps of the EV battery assembly. So back to you, Nick. Thanks. Thanks, James. And that's a great explanation and a complex operation with a large number of processes to, to get those batteries assembled. Um, we're going to move on now to our panel discussion. So um, if I can welcome all of our, our panellists uh, back. And okay. we can um, begin our q and I think we might have a few announcements, Chris, before then, but um, we've got questions from our audience as well uh, coming up. So yeah. which is really good. Thanks to everyone for all the great insights and to the audience, which has already been sending through questions, which will, of course, we'll move through as much as we can. And for those we don't get through, we'll make sure that we connect with the panel. We've got about a half an hour to, to dig in. And then we've had some a lot of great, great detail already. Um, I, I kind of just wanted to, to, to pick up on something that, that Danny and I were talking about earlier, which was on 
uh, the potential for automation, a high level of automation there, perhaps particularly through the modular, the modular modularization. And and maybe I start with you on that, Chris, as, as the other OEM. Is that something that in the manufacturing engineering you're you're already anticipating and and, and see see a lot of potential for? Maybe you can just give us some insights on that. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's two ends to that problem. Um, the first one is within within EVs. Um, the cost of, of, of an EV is significantly um, characterized by the cost of the materials. So actually, um, that's where we could have the biggest potential push down on the price of EVs, and that will obviously then mean that they get adopted more quickly. Um, but it, but it, it never stops. And I think somebody said that earlier, right, um, in terms of um, trying to be more efficient and trying to automate what we do. So that will always be there. One of the challenges we have with that traditional payback type calculation for automation here is, of course, the technology is moving so fast. So if I were to automate a traditional assembly line for an engine or a transmission, I can pretty much rely on that being there for the next 15, 20 years. And it will, you know, it will more than pay back. Right. Um, I'm not so sure about some of the lines um, that we're that we're planning for for EV. Obviously, we're planning in a lot of flexibility, and hopefully, we can deal with all the change that comes in the future. But I think, you know, we need to think quite hard actually um, about automation and whether it will stand the test of time. That's a really interesting point. How, how obviously that the shortening life cycles may in fact be the the. Yeah. the counterpoint to that i mean maybe you know just from your perspective as well danny because obviously being in serial production and looking ahead to the next stages of of, of, I, of other id products and meb i mean if, how has volkswagen kind of seen that that life cycle analysis in terms of the tooling and, and automation i mean you, you mentioned it in the beginning already yeah? so i think the the modules will become more and more important uh, and it's not only about the the hardware anymore so even though the the number of variants may go down when it comes to different car models and the specification of the cars, I think the, the biggest uh, way or the, the biggest criteria for differentiation will be the software and the items you can buy over the life cycle itself. So uh, there, there are already some scenarios where, let's say, the, the customer will get a fully equipped car and then only uh, pays uh, if he uses a certain item like like LED matrix light if he, he if he's doing a big tour uh, and then he just uh, gets rid of it uh, virtually uh, and not pay for it anymore on a, maybe on a on a monthly fee so all these updates i think will become more and more important and uh, I, I think the the biggest differentiation i mean we we spoke about that earlier in the the pre discussion when it comes to the facelift for instance after 3 years now it's a, it's a basically an on time facelift permanently and all these features are changing so i think also from an assembly point of view uh, in the first place it will be uh, more difficult to handle all these higher amount of modules, but we also hope that in the long run uh, it will be more standardized when it comes to the production itself, and the uh, the differentiation will be done during the uh, through the software. I mean, and going back to Chris's point on the modularization and, and the 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 constant the the shortened life cycle of the vehicles, and and all of the panelists have actually mentioned flexibility is sort of the key word. But in terms of when you're I'll put this to Chris to start with. When you're looking at setting up a production line and you're developing a process, has this changed the way, the, the type of equipment that you're considering buying now? You mentioned automation there, but has that sort of, do you look at it in a different way, the sort of systems and, and production equipment you're buying now with a view to as far as you can future proofing it and things like that? I think you're on mute, Chris. I'm sorry. So yeah, one of the one of the key considerations is uh, is product envelope and size, right? So um, trying to determine, particularly when you get down to you know components, trying to understand how that you know in what direction we're going to grow the component, where we're going to differentiate for the customer. So you know if it's a motor, is it all going to be in the diameter or the length, or you know, and try to establish up front, you know. Where are our, where's our point of growth and which way do we want to go? Because then you can start to size your facilities around that. So we've had lots of discussion around that, around that bill of design and what that could look like. And then from that, you can then start to plan a more flexible process. Um, so 
that's that's kind of where a lot of our focus is at the moment is what's the envelope and then and then you know start thinking about okay this is the type of equipment that would protect for that in the future and where we see growth and change but it you know it's tough right it, you know we're all learning um about these technologies right it's, it's we did the a similar thing with engines and we were pretty much spot on in terms of predicting where where th where growth would be and what we needed to protect for but I'm not sure we can be quite as sure with with uh, with electrified powertrains at this point in time. Yeah. And, and Danny, Dresden's recently been retooled for for ID4 production as well. So you would have been having probably some time ago during the planning phase these same discussions around equipment and processes that were needed. I suppose with the MEB platform, did that simplify things for you in the sense that you had something that was going to be very consistent and and as a platform, hopefully long lived. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it all started with the platform. Yeah? When, when we when we uh, started the planning here, how to do the assembly lineup and everything, uh, we started with the platform, and for sure it helps that the, the platform is more or less similar and only differentiate or is is different in the in the length and the width. But at the end of the day, also the assembly sequences are pretty much the same, even though you assemble different parts, also to have a different appearance to the customer itself. Uh, all the different lines and the, the different pricing levels uh, but at the end of the day we try to standardize every single production step in order to make it flexible uh, as, as also Chris said uh, we, it still will be a long way to, to really uh, gain further knowledge and to, to get more insights in, in where the, the way will be leading uh, but at the end of the day uh, you have to have a, a flexible starting base uh, to grow in every direction, depending on the customer's demand. Let's uh, let's turn to, to to an audience question. We've had quite a few few coming in here, and I'm going to probably direct this one to Gareth in the first instance from from a sort of manufacturing specialist point of view. What are the timelines we're looking at to have the desired flexibility, kind of building on what we were just talking about, in place? And are there kind of any two or three or any major technologies that will really help OEMs to reach that so do you want to kick us off on that uh time timelines is tough it, it depends what, what we're talking about we we've already supplied lots of these technologies to manufacturers already so i suppose you could say that we're we're ready to go in some regards but clearly there are there are developments still ongoing so it, I, I guess that's a come and talk to us sort of question um but the sorts of things i think we're we're thinking about um would be things like um measuring things like let's say temperature and product size. So you, you might find that um, you get very close to, to tolerances on a, on a part just because of the natural 24 hour heating and cooling cycle as the sun goes around us. Um, you may be able to get um, an awful lot of information out of that and even and tighten up your tolerance. You might never produce a bad part, uh, but what you're able to do is measure those components and take that data and use that data to narrow down the tolerances even further if you need to. You know, it's a it's a it's a only use it if you need to use it scenario. You don't want to gather all the information about everything, uh, especially if you don't know what you're going to use it for. The clarity of purpose, as I, as I alluded to earlier on, it's a it's a case of measuring what you should, but only measuring the things that you can then have an effect with. So a, a temperatures just just one thing. I mean, and and just looking at sorry, Chris, uh, you mentioned the, the quality control issue there is. If you look at the OEMs, you all and, and tier suppliers, they all have already preset quality control standards and systems in place for for monitoring that. But all these new things you mentioned the the state of that um, that Gareth mentioned there, the difficulty of access for some of these components. Um, and when James was uh, discussing the sort of battery pack assembly, which is far more complicated than probably you, if you hadn't seen one, you wouldn't realise what went into making one of those things. And quality control at every step of that is is key. Um, have, and this comes to Danny and Chris. Have you found that you need to um, adapt your quality control systems to meet new parameters that you perhaps weren't dealing with before? Um, and secondly, um, has this been has, has this been a, a, a limiter on how flexible you can be in terms of your because inline quality control, although it's developed quite a lot recently, is still a challenge, isn't it, to get the accuracy you need and the flow of product through the lines? Has that? changed with EV? Has it got simpler because there's less complexity in it? Although I say that reservedly because just listening to the conversations so, so far, 
no, it's not less complicated at all. Um, but it, has that changed at all, your quality control sort of processes? Uh, in 10 years' time, I might be saying it's less complicated because we'll have had a, a whole period of learning to understand you know, what, what you influence and what you measure and what you check to ultimately give the customer what they want. Um, but that that's going to take you know a whole period of learning to really truly understand that. I mean, yes, we're going to make quality products that our customers love to drive from day one, but ultimately to become more and more efficient um, and, and and truly understand what we control in the process and where we should control it to have a really good, tight, lean process is going to take a lot of time and development. I think we talked a little bit about big data, and that's going to play a huge part. You know, trying to measure in as many places in the process and understand the relationships between one part of the process and and and, and the rest of it and the finished product um, has you know a huge potential, really really big potential for for EV processes. Um, and I think that that's a really exciting area that we're we're looking at and and trying to develop. Um, you know, we see. Lots of lots of parameters that 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 affect that we, we create right at the start of our process, and yet they don't become a problem until the very end of the process. And you've got, you've got this huge potential for in-process waste, um, and we need to understand those better and use data to, to to give us that. But also, you know, something like a motor, we've we've inherited an old an old kind of you know people have been making motors for a very long time, but from 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 what we inherited, it was basically a process of you control everything that goes into that motor and you'll get a good motor out. But you, you know, the automotive mindset is obviously we want to be able to check that. We want to be able to understand that it's a good part and verify that before we give it to the customer. But in many cases, you know, you're creating things that, are, that you can't check unless you destroy the part. Um, and so that's a real big challenge for us is being able to have either controls where we can check things afterwards or we can check during manufacturing that we're getting it right. And there's, there's there's still a tremendous amount of work that a project like E Prime can do around that. And, and besides what you just said on the on the part itself or the modules itself, I think the, there's also huge progress to be expected on the inline measurement when it comes to all these optical measurement equipment and so on. Uh, so uh, what what we are benefiting or what we're setting up at the moment, for instance, is some some kind of measuring loop. Where you have the the measurement done from an optical point of view after the the doors are fit into the car uh, after the, or during the assembly process that you have some some mismatches there that will be collected also through the cloud and then uh, we send this data back to the body shop and maybe even to the press shop to see where the problem is coming from and why is it not done right in the first place so i think this especially in a in a large scale production this element of of key how fast you have this quality circle really closed and and rooted back the problem back to the to the origin itself has huge uh, potential when it comes to efficiencies our audience is picking up on 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 the, on the data side quite a bit as well the digitalization and, and and wants to know um you know how can manufacturers create value from collecting huge amounts of data? And is it something, so this is actually directed initially to you, James, you know, is that something that uh, as a man specialist, you're, you're initially you're focused on? So why don't you tell us a little bit and then perhaps Gareth, you can, you can give us a view from Benishol as well. Yeah, I think uh, data collection and digitalization is a, is a very interesting topic and it's certainly moving very quickly in this area as well. If you look at data collection itself, this has existed for 20 years. People have been collecting uh, data and, you know, storing that data for traceability reasons and, and, and doing, uh, you, know, you know, analysis of that. The problem is it's very historical analysis. So um, what's interesting today, I think, is to take that data real time coming into the system and then using uh, AI artificial intelligence to interpret that using some algorithms and then uh, give indications to the different teams within a production plant. So the production engineers or the quality engineers or uh, the different departments, the necessary real time information for them to take uh, corrective actions in real time on, on the production line before it, the problem becomes an issue and stops the, uh, the line. Um, so that's, something that we're doing it's it's a product which we're just launching right now which is uh, called Altur which is 
means alternative future and it's currently deployed across various customers around the world. Yeah, and I think just to, to add to that, I think um, you can do a number of things with the data. You can do all sorts of things. You could recognize that you have a variation in a process and you could, you can, you might try and control that process to, to get it to be more repeatable, more reliable, or you can just accept it happens and then take that data and maybe um, selectively assemble with different sized components, match components up. There's, there's different ways of doing this. It may be more expensive to try and control the process than it is to cope with the process. But having that information and that data and knowing what that does to your design and the efficiency uh, is important. Once these things are together, especially EV parts at the moment, once they're together, they're together for good. There's, there's no pulling them apart and, and making small adjustments. Um, so I think, as, as Chris alluded to earlier, the, the fact that um, once these assemblies are together, you, you've got an awful lot of money tied up in them. So it, it, it's often an iterative process, this, where you know we're beginning to learn what we, we would want to measure. Um, sometimes it surprises people what we can measure and what we can do with the data. Um, James has said we've, that this has been around for, for 10, 20, 30 years. Um, we're familiar with some of it. Um, often some of the developments with some of the sensors means it opens up a whole new range of possibilities. So as I said earlier, it's a really exciting time to be involved. I might just grab another audience question here, Nick, if you, if you don't yeah. mind, because there's two questions that came in similar, um, both kind of asking um, directed to, to Chris or Danny on, on some alterations in production flow, um, uh, whether whether how the battery, for example, might be might be changing the production flow and things like body shop as well, as well as a, a question here on um, the introduction of EVs, do we see processes moves from body in white or paint to final assembly? So effect, effectively, like how the how the process production flow is or might change. Um, so maybe we start with start with you, Danny, since you're you're in zero production. I mean, when it, when it comes to EV cars, as you might imagine, the the body shop requirements are significantly higher than normal combustion cars, as the the weight is is higher. Uh, the the whole uh, chassis has to carry and i think also when it comes to stability uh as the the point of gravity is rather low the the, the whole uh let's say driving system also needs to be adapted uh, so when it comes to the the weight of body and I, I think that's one of the the biggest challenges we had here in the in the very beginning when we did all the production planning is whether our conveyor systems especially for the for the powertrain assembly and also for the underbody uh, assembly the, the weight of the body was significantly higher and as you might know we we started with a phaeton here which is also quite a heavy car uh, and when you compare now the weight of the id3 is very similar to a, a eight cylinder phaeton uh, so even the, the car is way smaller so the, this is one of the the challenges you also have to consider uh, and I think that's why also the, the whole industry, especially from a body shop perspective, is tending towards bigger modules and, and less welding spots, for instance, uh, as you have a lot of construction, underbody construction to be done. So if you die cast the, the whole frame, the, the whole or at least some sub body parts already, then you can save a lot of money and, and also have way more stability in the process. And from an assembly point of view, as I mentioned already in the in the beginning, I think the, the biggest benefit is that you have a standardized approach now uh, on the powertrain itself, as it's always some, some kind of the, the same package. So the, the battery is basically the center of the whole process, and then the cars assembled around it. Uh, yeah, and, and I guess there's also quite a lot of discussion around um, cells and packs and arrays and and um whether you should have all of those and whether or whether you should be assembling you know for example cells straight into to, to vehicle bodies or um you know doing away with arrays completely um and just going straight to a, to a pack all those conversations go on continuously um but of course one thing we do have to remember is that you know this is a new technology and a brand like ford will always um, try to make sure that things are serviceable um you know that's really important to us that our customers can can maintain our cars at, at a reasonable cost so 
actually serviceability drives a lot of what we're doing as well in terms of how we assemble the vehicle and, and then for you to be able to disassemble it or or service it and with battery packs that must have been a big challenge i know um talking to james previously that um when the when you're putting the battery pack together you know it has to be accessible to some degree and yet have to be sealed up against pretty much everything so there's a kind of a contradiction in there in terms of what what the, what the challenges are across across the board i mean something you mentioned there danny i just wanted to pick up on the the the, the commonality of the powertrain with the evs um is good in one way because it's kind of simplifying it and obviously with, with volkswagen you have a standardized platform as well um is, although, but we were talking a little bit earlier about life cycle changes and refreshes and facelifts, which is all the fiddly little bits, the trims and things. So is the simplicity there been offset by the complexity of options elsewhere in the sort of build and the body? I mean, is that is that the case? Because obviously we're looking at designers going mad with, with cabin configurations now uh, in terms of what they potentially can do. Do you see that being offset? Do you see you not being any 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 better off in one area because of because of more complexity in another i think the the net effect is still positive when it comes to less complexity yeah for mm. sure so i think the the biggest thing now that comes into the the EV, especially the ev cars is not driven by by the assembly process anymore it's now more software driven uh, mm. and how to handle all the different modules and the, the capability of these modules when it comes to driver assistance systems, when it comes to the amount of data that needs to be processed within the, the, the car itself is huge. Uh, so I think that the biggest change now is also how to handle the, not the complexity during the assembly process itself and during the, the production process, but more on how to make sure that all the different models interact with each other in a proper way and also how to make sure that you have always the right software version coming from the supplier that is matching with the right hardware version coming from the supplier. And then if you want to do the whole software setup, uh, everything needs to match together. So I think that's uh, the, the biggest driver at the moment when it comes to complexity. That's an interesting, clearly an interesting point, at least in the context of the the wider challenge of the industry sees right now in terms of moving to this higher tech of production as well. But um, maybe I'd turn to you uh, again, Gareth. Um, just also perhaps partly related to that point in terms of things like software integration. But does this is this requiring Renishaw to to work differently, you know, with your your OEM partners, um, customers, and previously earlier perhaps in process, whether even you know whether in R and D and development phases, how is this sort of impacting your relationship and working patterns with, with your customers and partners? Um, I mean, the, when we work with people, obviously vary. So, some people we, we work with very early and, and others later. Obviously, it, it, it's better if you work earlier. Um, I think it's probably best um, encapsulated into um, three, three words. It's, it's speed, flexibility, and control so that the speed desire is obvious. People want to be able to hit the tack time and inspect a load of things. But as soon as you give an engineer more speed, it's unbelievable how many more things come out of the woodwork to inspect. So actually you, you give them the, the ability to measure twice as many parts. And actually what a lot of engineers do is measure more on the same part. They get they want more density. They, they don't, don't wanna just take a few points. They wanna take a scan on the surface. So it's up to each individual as to what they do with that data, whether they use it to get more throughput or whether they, they, they measure more. So the, the speed's the first thing. The flexibility, I think we've, we've really already talked about the fact that you don't know what's coming down the line. So being able to pick up a non-contact sensor, a contact sensor, a surface finish probe, and, and maybe not buy those in the first the first um, capital spend, but maybe add those at a later date is is really useful. And then the control side is is all about using that data. You're no longer a goalkeeper with, for example, a CMM or a programmable gauge, where you're stopping rogue components getting into the system. And of course, you can do that, but moreover, you're now measuring and using that data to do something meaningful. You're, you're passing that information upstream to a process that under conventional measures, there's nothing wrong with. It's still passing components, but it might be drifting towards its process limits. So before it gets anywhere near those process limits, 
just put a small change in, just make a small adjustment. Um, so it's constantly feeding those adjustments in so that the process has a better CPK value for, for uh, the quality um, people out there will understand exactly what I mean. It's a, it's a more repeatable process. So speed, flexibility, control, and it's all of those three th things rolled into one. James, would you add anything to that? But I mean, obviously, you know, you've talked about partnership earlier. Atlas Capco has also expanded its own capabilities too, clearly um, with, with other partners as well. Do you have anything you could add there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, definitely. I think OEMs and suppliers are working differently today. They have to adapt, adapt to the uh, changing environment and uh, everything is, is changing so quickly now and it's, it's on an exponential curve. So um, I think the formation of, of long-term partnerships and collaborations in, in key technology areas is, is, is critical to, to be successful in the future. So um, it means suppliers can be you know, involved in the early stages of design and potentially influence uh, uh, the processes and save money later in, in, you know, in, in production or even in the field. Um, it simplifies the uh, procurement process and, and meaning faster time to market uh, for the, the end products. Um, and I think most importantly really is it facilitates a good R&D collaboration between the supplier and the OEM um, so that the products are actually aligned to, to the OEM's needs. So all OEMs are, are, are specific you know, in, in, in their needs. So, um, yeah, it's also the opportunity to leverage the links that we have with the universities and, and other academic bodies in order to uh, to bring that competence into the frame as well. I think we've got we've got time for a couple more questions, Chris. Do you think? I think we can we can push in probably two more, but we'll we'll kind of keep we'll we'll we'll, we'll move to the thirty second answer framework um, so that everyone, <laughs> <laughs> so we can try and clear up in this couple of minutes. But yeah, let's let's go to the last kind of two questions or so. Yeah. Um. I mean. Uh. So these are these are these are, we kept the, the hardest questions for the end, obviously. And Chris says you've got like you know fifteen seconds to answer these, so so no pressure. Um. But looking ahead and given sort of accelerating pace of change. Where do you see the need, where are the next level of competences that you need to add to get EV production to the levels you want it to be? Um, and that's across the whole panel, but we can start with our colleagues from the OEMs to start with. Uh, quick answer, data analytics. Yeah. Snap. <laughs> I, I, I agree. <laughs> you said 15 seconds. <laughs> so we're beating time. 15 seconds, not one word answers. There's a, there's a, there's a difference. But it's interesting. Yeah, that's it. The data I, I agree, has been too. <laughs> yeah. the, the, the catch, of course, is it's easy to say that, but that's a colossal field in itself. Yeah. It is. Yeah. It is. And, 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 you know, so we're, we're facing now, you know, we normally take on apprentices every year. We're actually going to put people through data analytics degrees and, uh, and apprenticeships, right? Not not the traditional mechanical electrical engineering degrees. We're going to take on a whole group of people and they're going to go through that process because it's really important to us. Yeah, yeah and I, I to build on that, I, I would say it is down to having the right people on board and the, the right mindset and the right competencies. So digitalization is ambiguous by nature and the future isn't clear. And we ought to be successful, I think we need to be quite humble flexible in our approach and yet sort of ambitious to to be successful in the future so we need to have you know the right mindset and uh, you know move away from the more fixed mindset approach uh, and deploy agile thinking in ways of working so these are all new things that we have to bring in to you know be successful with digitalization and for sure, strong competencies in, in, in software and digitalization and artificial intelligence, these are, these are really going to be key. 
front, as you said too, Danny. I mean, we've got to get the software side of side of it right. So you know, and, and uh, it's interesting, and I think it's probably a topic for another day. But it's probably no coincidence that Volkswagen has in-house software teams now and, and and units that are kind of helping to integrate and do that. So I think those are all really important. If there's any last point on, we, we also wanted to know if you if you saw the biggest production opportunity for optimization uh, to scale up EV. Perhaps we've we've covered it already, but I guess and if, if anyone has anything else they'd want to add into the mix before we close. Does that give me the same answer, data analytics? Uh, like, <laughs> I, I, possibly, yes. And yeah. answer is, another, is there another jewel that we can fish out? <laughs> I think one, one big benefit when it comes to the automated driving, for instance, is how to integrate this into the production process. Yeah, because as soon as the car has all the data it needs, it can basically drive autonomous, autonomously from the assembly line and do all the finishing checks, do the, the noise check, the rattling test and everything by itself. And especially when it comes to the outbound logistics, which is also mainly done manually, I think there's also a huge potential for productivity. I'd, I'd, we'd agree with that too. Um, and of course, the other area is 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 around battery manufacture, cell manufacture. Um, you know, it's going to have to grow significantly. We all know that, and the skills uh, and knowledge that we need to do that are are, are are going to become a critical skill for us in in the UK and and throughout Europe, I guess. So I guess that would change when you put the wheels on the vehicle. You you may switch around the processes. To get it mobile on its under its own uh, own power earlier. Mm. Well, th we we've taken a, a lot of the, the panel's time, um, and I want I want to want to thank everyone for these last ninety minutes of really fantastic insights. Uh, our audience really, you know, you can tell by the comments coming through. Other questions we didn't get to, which we will share with the group afterwards, and perhaps we can arrange some follow up on how how we can get some of the answers that couldn't have been. Uh, addressed today but but first and foremost thanks to to James McAllister, Chris White, Danny Aliswald and to Gareth Tompkinson for for joining us today. It's a pleasure thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And we will have this episode available on our on our website shortly probably by by tomorrow so for anything anybody missed can catch up afterwards. And um yeah we just would just like to close with a quick Quick reminder, I think, uh, Nick, why don't you just tell us quickly about what, what our latest coverage? Yeah, latest editions, um, tier suppliers, uh, and again, with an electrical thread running through that, again, similar challenges, uh, different, slightly different perspective, and uh, electric vehicle digital edition. Uh, so again, OEM is committing big time to, to vehicle manufacturing, EV manufacturing, uh, development and technologies and materials. So both in our digital editions, which you can find at uh, Automotive Manufacturing Solutions, along with a lot of other content and uh, recordings and catch up of our previous live streams. So thank you for joining us. And thanks again, as Chris said, to our panel for their time today. Um, great to have you guys and, and a lot of insights there. Thank you very much. Thank thank you. You. Just again to remind thank everyone you. to join us in a couple of weeks. So the, the link was already put to you. So we hope to see you in a couple of weeks for Factory of the Future. And um, you know, have a great, a great rest of day and weekend, and catch up, catch up, and everything on the AMS website. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thank you.